I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Sing with us. And I lift my voice to worship you. Consider the work of the hands, the wonders that you have done. What is man that you are mindful of him? Why does he care, care for us? Let's turn our praise into song. When I see the beauty of the sunset glory, amazing on the street across the evening sky, when I feel the mystery. Of a distant galaxy, it awes and humbles me to be loved by a God so high. What can I do?
morning again. We, we thank you for joining us for worship at 9.05. Be sure to fill out the stub on the right-hand side of your, your bulletin. One of the ministries that I want to hold up to you today is our new church start. The Beacon is uh, going to be having service Saturday night at 7 o'clock in the gym. And I invite you to come out and support Pastor Dave and, and the Beacon as we, we uh, work to get that church off the ground. Also, uh, if you weren't here last week, there was a fire alarm at 9.05. <laughs> I was so blessed by what the youth did. And I know some of you didn't get to experience all of it because of the fire drill, but you know, if you went that way, you saw them all gathered around and somebody had their car stereo going and it just didn't stop for them. And what a great witness it was to all of us of, of what it's like to have a heart unencumbered for Christ. So young people, thank you very much. Uh, those of you that are here and the rest of you, if you see a young person, be sure to thank them. Uh, let's... Uh, Go to the Lord now and, and just uh, prepare our hearts in an attitude of prayer. God, this morning we come before you. Some of us here need to know that you're stronger. Some of us here know, need to know that you are healer as you are wiser than any other. May we hear from you this morning as we worship you in spirit and in truth, as we honor you with our worship, with our lives. Our God is greater, our God is wiser, our God is healer. Water, you turned into wine. Let's sing this out to him now. He's in the business of miracles. Water, you turned into wine. Oh, open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power Our God Our God Into the darkness you shine. Lift your voice and sing this now. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power. Our God. Say one more time now, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Here's the good news. If our God is for us, who can be against us? Would you rise up with me this morning and proclaim that? If our God is for us, then who can be against us? We say these words now. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against us? If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against What could stand against us? What could stand against Stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our 
says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made so this morning as we as we come into his presence as we pray to him as we pray with him through Jesus um, this morning I want to invite you to consider uh, what is what is it that God needs to be working on in you what is it that God needs to be working out through you so this morning uh, let's pray together God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into your presence, to know that you are good, to know that you are a healer, to know that you are working things out. And Father, this morning, some of us uh, would just like to lay our cares, our sins upon you. And so we confess them to you silently this morning. And hear these words that God is saying back. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed. His grace is greater still. And all of your wrong choices He's full of mercy And He's ever kind Hear His invitation His arms open wide And you can come as you are With all your broken pieces all your shameful scars of the pain you hold in your heart give it all to Jesus you can come as you are so Father we come to you as we are that you would take us and that you would make us into creatures that take on your likeness. We know that your promises are good, that you wash us and we are white as snow. So this morning we cling to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray as we lift the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we invite the ushers to come forward as we receive the, the offering. And as we receive the offering this morning, um, we want to do a song. And this is a call and response song. So as we sing it, you have to sing it back. And I invite you, as we're, as we're passing 
on the, the offering place, I invite you to consider what is it that you're passing on um, to your family, to your friends, to the future generations? What is it that you want to pass on um, through your faith? So here's how it goes. We sing, pass it on, and you say, pass it on, 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 the wonders you have done. You have done. I think you can do that for me. Let's try this. Pass it on. 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 The one that you have done. You're gonna get another shot at that. Giving you glory, honor, blessing, and praise. Together we'll pass it on the greatness of your way. Would you sing that with us? We're giving you glory, honor, blessing, and praise. Together we'll pass it on the greatness of your way. Every generation. Every generation will tell the children of your awesome power. Every generation, they will tell the children of your awesome power and your mighty acts. They will tell the stories of your faithfulness and glory. We will pass it on. And we will pass it on to all who get to come. How you've been slow to anger and those so rich in love and only celebrate the wonders you have done. We're giving you glory. Giving you glory. Take them and use them for the furtherment of your kingdom here on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand for our scripture reading from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Impossible. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Really? But in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you've renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Really. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. Today we start a new series called Rethink Church. Last week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I was at a pastor's seminar that I have been blessed to go to the last few years. And one of the themes at this seminar every year is, uh, what can we do to revitalize the United Methodist Church? And just in case that sounds odd to you, um, I would let you know that the United Methodist Church, like most mainline denominations, have been in decline for years. In fact, in 2007, the United Methodist Church in America lost 73,000 in Sunday morning worship attendance. In 2008, we got better. We only lost 55,000 in Sunday morning worship attendance. That means in, in 2008, basically, we took 45, 48 churches of this size and closed them. Imagine doing that. Imagine just picking 45 churches this size around the country and and, and closing them. The statisticians in our denomination tell us that if we don't reverse the trend in uh, 40 years or so, there won't be any of us left. So there's this rethink campaign. Let's think about church differently. Did you see the video? Were you watching? You see the little... What if church was this? What if church was that? I'm going to see how well you were watching. What were the sentences? What if the church did not condemn? What if the church was outspoken? What if the church put faith into action? What if the church was comforting? What if the church put words and deeds into action? You all did great. You know, thanks to the miracle of pause and start, I got them all, and I wrote them down, and there is a bunch of them. I mean, in in a matter of like a 55-second video, there is just a a caboodle of ideas they're putting on the table. What if the church was like breathing? What if the church confronted poverty? What if the church astounded you? What if the church was a source of light? What if the church offered mercy? What if the church was always honest? What if the church made you visible? So on. And I, and I listen to all of this, and I say, you know what? Isn't that what Jesus asked us to do? Is to rethink our lives? Is to look at life differently than how the rest of the world looks at life? And I, I'm going to suggest to you, I don't think the problem is the church or the bishops or the structure or the organization. I think the problem is that Christians have forgotten what it means to live the Christian life. 
There are many kinds of people here today. Certainly today at some point, there will be non-believers in our sanctuary. Don't be bothered by that. There's no better place for a non-believer to be than right here. Because I will just tell you, God is so awesome. What I hope to accomplish through words, what the music department hopes to accomplish through singing, what we hope will happen through prayers, sometimes it doesn't. But God has a way of reaching people. So if you're here today and you're a non-believer, welcome. What a great place to be. Man, I just hope the Holy Spirit just gets all over you and you walk out the door going, I don't know what happened. I can't quite explain it, but something is different on the inside. Others, we're just going to have an honest talk today. Some of us here today simply dabble in Christianity. We just sort of kind of wade in and get our feet wet, just kind of just kind of checking it out. Some of us are more committed. Some of us take it more seriously, but let there be no mistake, and hear me, hear me. Every single one of us has a mix of the Christian faith and this soft secular American dream that has just infiltrated how we live out our faith. Every single one of us has taken the claims of the gospel and made it a little bit more comfortable for us, a little more palatable, something I can live with, something that's a little more convenient to me. We have great schools. That's why people move to this area. We have nice places to live. And how does Jesus reach people that have so much? Because we are so pulled by so many things. I talked to someone a few weeks ago. They said, you know, I've believed my whole life. What, what else is there? Well, there's a lot more. I mean, all of us can believe in Jesus. We can believe in the postal service. We can have warm feelings about the postal service. But that doesn't make us a committed follower. Just simply believing in Jesus doesn't mean we're living the Christian life. I suggest to you today, there's a caboodle of Christians, and all of us are probably them sometimes, who like to rest in the thought that we believe in Jesus, but are really living our lives however we choose to live our lives. So as we start this series, Rethink Church, I want to ask you to rethink life. I want, I want you to just spend a few minutes this morning with me and contrast the difference between how the world says to live, how living comes naturally to us, and what the Christian life is really about. Now, all of you know how, how we grew up. Pretty easy. We're all born, and what's the first thing we say? Wah, wah. Hold me. Feed me. Feed me more. Feed me more. What's, will you somebody take care of that smell, please? You know, we start to get bigger. And all of a sudden, people gather around. They say, oh, isn't he cute? Come here, little Jeffy. Come here, come here to me, Hoji. How many years do we spend growing up and it's all about us? And the bigger we get, the bigger our spoon becomes. Pretty soon, we're like baby Huey. And I mean, just think about what happens to us. We are conditioned to wander into life thinking it's about me. Feed me. Give me more. Solve my problems. Make it easy. And then we become teenagers. Dad, I want those expensive shoes like so-and-so. I mean, if you're my age, do you remember the first time your kids came home and they didn't want those Walmart shoes anymore? 
Some of us are just like grown-up teenagers. No, all of us. All of us. Because we just want more. Spoons aren't big enough. We need a pipe. Feed me. Dave, feed me. Get the funnel, pour it down. I want more. Fix the stock market, Dave. God, solve my, God, wherever you're at, solve my problem. Bruce, I need a friend. Where are you at? Come on, help me out here. Uh, fix this thing with my job, will you? Be nice to my kids. My kids need a friend. Will you be my, we have this, boy, this gets tiring. Man, feed me, fix me, solve me. I want more. I want, the, why did he get the promotion and not me? I want more. Feed me. Fill me. Why did they change the music at church? Feed me. Fill me. Make it go my way. I mean, can you imagine the size of spoon we have sometimes? It's a big old giant pipe. God, I can't get enough. And Paul says, rejoice always? Really? That's impossible when we are living the secular Christian life. Peace? You'll experience peace? Never, as long as it's always about me getting more. Content in all things? Are you kidding? We don't have any idea what contentment is about because our whole life model is about you give to me. You fix me. God, wherever you're at, you fix me. And all of our prayers have become about God fixing me, God making it easier on me, as if that's what the Christian life was about. But you know, that sounds just an awful lot like what we're like when we're born. I want to offer you another model today, another picture, that there's some other way for us to live. And I need someone to play God for a minute. I know many of you have wanted to do this for a long time, so uh, who would volunteer? Doug, come on up. You know, when my daughter was about seven, Jen, I won't mention which one, Jennifer, oh, sorry, um, <laughs> So headstrong, so headstrong, running around the house, saying how it was. And I said to her, who do you think you are, the boss of the world? And she said, no, but someday I'd like to be. <laughs> so you're God. You're God. You are the source of everything that is good. You are a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You, you are that one that when we figure out who you are, we just... And you got something to give. Okay? Now, okay. It's going to come together. Trust me. <laughs> give that to John. Give, give John an end of that. John needs some of what you got. Where am I in this picture? Do you know what this is? I probably called it a pipe, but it's really a conduit, okay? When we come to Jesus, we are hungry and we are receivers. But once we receive that grace, we become the conduit, the hands and feet of Christ on this earth. And I am connected to God, not simply because I come to church, but because His love and grace and power are flowing through me to those who are grieving, to those who need God's love. And I get up in the morning, and this is what my life is about, to those who are hurting, to everyone I can possibly find. This is what the Christian life is about. 
Thank you, God. We'll put that down for a minute. And this is going to sound odd, but God, you may be seated. (laughs) Imagine your life where you wake up in the morning and you say, who is there for me to care about today? How can I make room in my life for someone else? I want to tell you something, friends. For that, we are created. And you want to know why you don't feel close to God anymore? It's because we've been standing around asking Him where He is and how He can fix our problems instead of asking Him to flow through us. Because the moment we begin to ask Him to start flowing through us, we find Him. And we're filled with Him. And His grace just bubbles out rivers of living water pouring out of us. And it's at that moment when we hear the Scripture, rejoice always. That's right. In the midst of trouble, in the midst of pain, in the midst of worry, I can rejoice because I'm thinking about and I'm doing what I was created to do. To the extent that we live for ourselves, we miss the joy and the peace, and we have no sense of what contentment is. But the day that the scales fall from our eyes and we realize that we are here to bless other people, to be used by God to love other people, all of that stuff that we were seeking so desperately becomes ours because it's pouring through God, from God, through us to others. Received an email from a friend who was on a trip in Denver. He wrote that we were walking in the downtown in the afternoon and a 20-year-old girl asked for spare change. He said, I did what I always did. I just looked away and kept going. He said, I got five steps and I stopped. And I turned around and I went back and gave her all the money in my pocket. He said, she thanked me profusely. He said, later we ate dinner, had a lot of pizza left over. We're going to make our way back to the train to hit out to the suburbs where our hotel was. And there was a man playing the guitar hoping for donations, but I had nothing left to give. And as I stood there listening to him, he said, it occurred to me that maybe he would like the pizza. And he said, I offered him the pizza, and he received it, and you could see the joy on his face. Now, here's my question to you. Who went home that day with the most joy? The girl that got the money, the man that got the pizza, or your member who was the hands and feet of Christ. And this isn't a story, this isn't a sermon about helping homeless people. This is a sermon about how you live every day, about every person you come in contact with. The folks in your office. On the way home from that pastor's seminar, I was supposed to fly from Salt Lake City to Kansas City, and I got to the airport for a 2.15 flight, and it said, on time. That's good news, right? And then I looked up 10 minutes later, and it said, delayed an hour and a half. And I thought, okay, I'm counting when I'll be home, you know, okay, that'll make it about... 7.15. And then a little while later, delayed three hours. And I thought, "Mm, mm, 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 mm." and then about a half hour later, they came on the speaker, flight 3456, that actually was the number, canceled. Go to the phones down here, and a Delta agent will help you. 
And of course, I had my computer tied up, and I had my earphones on, and the cords were wrapped around my legs, and all these people got up and started to rush. And I got up, and I had to untangle myself, and by the time I got there, they were all getting on the next flight that was going out to Kansas City. And I talked to the agent on the phone for about 15 minutes. She put me on hold, and I got cut off. Isn't that how those were? Anyway, to make a long story short, I got home at about 11.15. I was glad to be home. But it was interesting to witness the fury of so many people who were inconvenienced because their life was about them and what they wanted to do and where they wanted to be and what they thought they were entitled to. Story is told of a a man who prayed, God, I'd like to see what heaven and hell are like. And so one night in a dream, an angel came to him and took him on a trip, took him to a place, to a hallway, to a door, said, sir, this is hell. He opened the door, and inside the room was a big table, wonderful smelling stew on the table, and a whole bunch of skinny, emaciated, unhappy people around the table. They had really long-handled dippers strapped to their arms, and they could get the dipper into the stew, but they couldn't get it to their mouth. And so they lived in the state of misery, seeing what they wanted and never quite being able to have it. The angel said, this is hell. Took him to another place, off another hallway was another room, opened the door, and to the man's surprise, it's the same picture, right? Round table, bowl of stew in the middle. But this time, all the people around the table are happy and fat and sassy. The angel says, this is heaven. And the man says, I don't understand. And the angel said, simply this. In heaven, they've learned to feed each other. Still awake? You choose in this life, hell on earth or heaven on earth. Good Christian people that believe in Jesus are still living a hell on earth because they still want everything. They still think it's about everyone feed me. But there is another choice, and it is the life that Jesus begs us to pick up. It is the cross, it is the way, it is the path. It is that place where we understand that we are here to be a conduit of God's grace. And so each of us will choose a hell or a heaven. And I invite you today to rethink your life and to allow this amazing God to fill you and flow through you, that's when we find the joy, the rejoicing, rejoicing in the Lord always, the peace, and in all things, contentment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the great opportunities that we have in this life to learn, to change, to become more like you. Fill us, use us to touch and encourage someone else. And in giving ourselves away, may we find that joy that was there all the time. Bless your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.